Today, um, we're here to worship God, so forget about ourselves, any distractions that we have in life. We're here to worship. And uh, actually, the lineup that we have for today for songs, uh, the thing that we have is really proclaiming in the power of the name of Jesus. Yeah? So I hope these songs, you know, would really help us anchor our peace to Jesus, trusting in the name of his power, right? So the first song that we're going to sing, I Speak Jesus. Go! 
Yeah. 
sisters. What a blessed Sunday afternoon to be gathered here to for one purpose and one purpose only, and that is to praise and worship the Lord. Amen? Amen. So, for those who don't know me, my name is Jude, and this is my beautiful younger sister, Jordine. So, how was everyone's week? Um, I wish everyone had a great week. I mean, it was Valentine's week. I wish you guys have celebrated with your loved ones. And... But regardless of the week that we've had, uh, be it good, be it bad, um, this is the time where we let all of that go. This is the time for us to focus on one thing and one thing only, and that is for our hearts to worship and praise the Lord. Amen. Um, well, it's such a blessing to be in front of everyone today. So I I'll read from Psalms 100, verses 4 to 5, and it states, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise him. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Um, you know, let us ready ourselves to enter today's service uh, and to give thanks and praise to God with all our hearts. Let's have a great service. Amen. So, brothers and sisters, as we enter this gate, as we enter today in this service, let us ready our heart, our mind, and our spirit to focus on God and God alone. You know, the world out there has so many uh, dis uh, distractions, so much uh, things that will disturb us from our main purpose, which is to praise God. But now, after a long week that we've had, we can just focus ourselves on praising God. Amen. So for today's service, we have an amazing lineup that will lead us to praising the Lord. So we will be led to the foot of the cross by the communion by uh, Brother Meshel. And uh, we will have our main service, uh, our, our main sermon to be led by our Uncle Jacob. And we will be, it will be closed lastly by uh, Brother Gary and Sister Arlene, and uh, for all those who are coming here today, for those visitors, welcome, and we hope and we pray that uh, you'll get something from today's service, amen? amen? So let's go to God in prayer. Almighty Father God, what a true blessing to have been gathered here today, Father. We are truly grateful that uh, we are all here for one purpose and one purpose only, to worship and praise you, Father. After an amazing and long week that we've had, that we get to put everything aside and just ready ourselves for you, Father. It truly is a blessing. For your love is so good and so great, and we just want to give back a tiny ounce of that, Father. And we pray that you will guide our hearts throughout the service. And we love you, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh, 
is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who to confess, fullness of God in helpless faith, the gift of God. Righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was paid. Here in the death of Christ, I live. So the, the last song, the song that we just seen uh, in Christ alone, that perfectly describes uh, what Jesus has done for us, the final sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice that was done 2,000 years ago, that we should always and all the time remember, and uh, we should really value that. So the particular verse, no guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. So the, in the first uh, and the second stanzas, it describes about the, how Jesus you know, went through, how he died on the cross. And in the, in the closing stanzas, how he triumphed our death, how he overcome death, and how he uh, become victorious on the cross after his death. So that was the song. And uh, it's a very beautiful written uh, hymn. So, uh, regarding that one, no guilt in life, no fear in death. It's the power of Christ. So, guilt is something, you know, we, on and off, we go on through. Right. 
though we may not admit to everyone, even to the people that we live in uh, near their ones, but there's something that is internal that we struggle, that often comes and um, this, that often disturbs us and even, you know, like it leads us to many things, many negative things, negative consequences. Uh, the difference between guilt and uh, remorse. Remorse in biblical term, a term would be like a godly sorrow, where we uh, understand it and then we try to uh, do it a, and then repent it and overcome it. But when it comes to guilt, that's not always. It's something negatively that affects us and it can even destroy us. So, I mean, if we have to, you know, like if, uh, ask ourselves, we have to examine I mean, about our past from, from today, you know, all these years from our childhood uh, till now in the journey of life. We have done so many things, right? So many mess of things. And I'm sure many of us will go through this, um, uh, this guilt in our life, right? About the things that we have seen, the uh, the words that we have, uh, with the words that we have heard, people, you know, uh, the expectations that we are not able to fulfill, met in our life, the, the our parents' expectations, our family expectations, right? The betrayals, and so many things, you know, the relationships, and we. I mean, we might. I mean, we go through all these things, you know, and that takes away our joy. That, and that can even troubles keeps on, you know, troubling us again and again if we don't deal with it, if we don't open it, if we don't solve it. So, it's a negative experience, uh, as it says. But, like us, like in the song, you know, how Jesus has overcome the cross, and how he also, you know, uh, if, if you look in the in the Bible. You know, Regarding that one, uh, Romans eight one. If you look there, there is therefore now no condemn condemnation on them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life is Jesus Christ, and made me free from the law of sin and death. So what it means is, we are free from. The guilt, there is no condemnation. Jesus has paid it all. Let's not live in the past. Let's not live in regret. Let's live behind. Let's move on. Let's lighten the burden that we put ourselves on. Let's, um, we are, uh, when, on, when we decided to become disciples, this is what we have, you know, make a decision that to follow Jesus and to depend on God in every situation, right? So that's what separates us from we, those who follow Jesus, uh, God and Jesus, and those who do not believe in God, right? We have somebody that has paid for us. We have somebody that can always give us strength. That we have somebody who can um, forgive, I mean, who had already, you know, like, removed all the debt that we had in the past. So this is what, uh, this is what the Bible assures us, that there's no more condemnation. Let's look forward. Let's, you know, move on with life. And let's not be burdened by all the regrets, all the uh, guilt, all the sins that we have committed in the past. So, and then as it says, there's no fear in that. So that is something that I'm sure everyone, uh, you know, we are scared of to experience that. Even I personally, I would not want to die now or tomorrow or this year or next year or many years. I would like to live long. But a person who truly believes in God, we believe that there is eternal life. There is life after this, uh, which is much, much more, you know, uh, better, far, you know, incomparable. So this is what we have uh, when we follow Jesus. This is what Jesus said, you know, paid for us. This is the gift of salvation. This is the gift of salvation, you know, that just paid through cross, uh, on the cross, right? As it says, he had died and no guilt. He had already died for us. There is no guilt, no sin. So that's always something uh, that uh, let's always remember that, and uh, let's value this uh, precious gift uh, on the cross that God has ultimately given through Jesus Christ. So that's something that I would like to say today. Uh, at this time, 
will have the bread and uh, the wine, which represents his body and uh, his blood. And let's always meditate on it and remember his ultimate sacrifice. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful uh, afternoon where we remember your uh, death on the cross, Father. Thank you, Father, for this uh, uh, sending your son, your only son on the cross, um, through so many um, excruciating, you know, I, I can't imagine how, you know, it might have been, Father God, to be on that cross in the nail, blood, pierced, Father God, um, killed on the cross, Father God. But your love is so, your love for us is so much great that, you know, you're willing to send, uh, you're willing to put your senses on this, Father God, just for us, Father God, so that we can no longer, Father God, live for ourselves, and live in regrets, live in the past, live a sinful life, Father God. Help us to remember this ultimate gift. Help us to always remember and value this uh, ultimate sacrifice, Father God. Uh, prepare our hearts even as we take this um, wine and bread, Father. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
because of who I am, but because of what you've done, not because of what I've done, but because of who
singing ministry put forward a team and I always get blown away how they all fit in because God's word always fits in but it's always a joy to see things fitting in. Uh, one of our sisters lost her husband this week uh, on Wednesday morning they lost their they uh, she lost her husband she had to rush back to uh, rush back to India Sibi, she is from the Dabza ministry, and her husband was, of course, uh, in Dubai, and then he had a heart attack when he was here uh, many years uh, down the road. Now we've lost him. So please be keeping uh, Sibi and their daughter, uh, Saya. Saya, in your prayers. Awesome. Uh, Basam also needs your prayers. They have a work emergency. They uh, broke a pipe, about 14 meters deep, I believe. Last 48 hours he's been at work. This morning when I called him just to follow up, he's got a chest pain because there's a lot of things going uh, on with, uh, I think uh, there's a danger to the nuclear reactor in, in, in Alain and there's a whole, I mean there's a pipes are closed, water is not, uh, and there's no solution yet, at least till this morning. So please be keeping him in, his well, in your prayers, that's why he's not here today. I hope you celebrated the Valentine's Day. It, it, it is something that people celebrate once a year, but I hope in your home, it's an ecosystem of love that, that's there throughout the year and not just on that one day. So I have a story for us this morning. Is the story, is everybody okay? Yeah. Yeah. I know, it's, I know it's, it's, it's already the end of February and the, the, the singles are looking forward to a singles retreat. Yeah. But uh, let me, there you go. The leader of the singles is, of course, the most fire. <laughs> a couple decided to go to a warm place. This is winter time, and decided to go to a warm place uh, because uh, <clears throat> they went to the same city where they had their honeymoon. Okay, and this is 20 years later, 20th anniversary. Uh, of course, their, their their schedule was such that the husband had to go one day early. The wife will follow the next day. The husband checked into the hotel. And he was surprised to see a computer in his room. So he decided to send an email to his wife. However, he accidentally left out one letter and the email went to someone else. Meanwhile, somewhere in another country, a widow has just returned home from her husband's funeral. You know where this is going. And uh, the widow decided to check her mail, expecting condolences and everything. She had just come back from the funeral. Um, and she looked at the screen, at the first message, she shouted loudly and fell down unconscious. The son ran into the room and this is what was on the screen. To my loving wife, I have just arrived today. I know you'll be surprised to hear from me. They have computers here now. And you're allowed to send emails to your loved ones. So I've just arrived and I thought I would send an email to you. Everything has been prepared for your arrival tomorrow. <laughs> Looking forward to seeing you soon. Hope your journey is as uneventful as mine. By the way, it sure is very hot here. I hope you can get that Amen. Let's go to God. Father, what a joy it is to know that we can actually 
be on solid ground, so that we can put our hope in an incredible personal Savior, that we have a chance, God, to call you Abba, because that is what you've been to us, God. There are so many things in this world that could try to push us out of our faith. But more importantly, Lord, it's the stilling voice, the whisper that you have. It's a spirit that enables us. That's our conscience fighter on a daily basis. And Lord, it's your community, the church, that makes all the difference. Father, we know we fall short. None of us are above board, but more importantly, Lord, we understand that grace can be taken for granted. Help us, God, to know you, and Lord, to be able to have a heart that forever would allow you to transform us into whatever you want us to be on that judgment day. We love you, Lord. We commit ourselves and this whole time into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's go to Andrew back. Um, the sermon title is Be the Change. I got this message from the title from one of the brothers I was spending time with last week. Um, Be the Change. You know, when I was 12 years old, I landed in the city. And this is a picture from 1980. No, 1977. And uh, it was something that blew me away to look at this picture because this is the only tall building in the all of UAE. Yeah. 32 floors of the Trade Center building. And that you see on the first interchange, that's the first interchange. And that road goes to Abu Dhabi. There was only the Toyota building on the right, and there was Emirates building on the left, and one more tall building on the other side, about seven to eight floors, and that's it. Rest all <coughs> were one, one story. So this is about, this is 1977, okay? This is a Greek side uh, where you can see data from where we were living at the time. Okay, I fell in love with this place because I was 12 years old. If you go to Umalkwen, by the way, this is how Umalkwen looks now from those early days. And uh, six years later, of course, I had to leave the city to go back to studying further in India, and I was very sad to leave it. Leave it. But 14 years later, this city is a transformed place, right? 2003, if you came here, you would have seen all that transformation because that's when things started taking off. And in about a few years, we're, we're probably one of the top cities in the world. But 40 plus years can be a transitioning thing for all of us, right, Mark? It can be transitioning in so many ways. It can be transitioning in our ecosystem and everything that we are part of. 40 years ago, everyone wanted to have children. Today, many are afraid to have children. They would rather have cats and dogs for their, if they are married, to have as their babies. And I have one uh, in, very close to us who, are, who have decided that. 40 years ago, children respected their parents, at least outwardly. Today, parents have to respect their children. 40 years ago, marriage was easy. Divorce wasn't. Today, divorce is easy. Marriage is not that easy. Or it's difficult to get married. 40 years ago, we all knew our neighbors. Still today, we are in touch with all neighbors that we had. But now, people don't even know their neighbors. Generally, we don't even know our neighbors. 40 years ago, villagers were flocking into the city to find jobs. Now, people are flocking out of the city to find peace. 40 years ago, people wanted to look fat to look happy. Now, they died to look healthy. 40 years ago, rich people in, pretended to be poor. Today, the poor people pretend to be rich. 40 years ago, only one person worked to support the whole family. Now, all have to work to support one child. 40 years ago, people loved to read books, study. Now, people love to update Facebook and read their WhatsApp messages. So, the world is transition. The world is constantly changing. And whether we like it or not, you know, it is something that we are part of. We are part of that ecosystem. You know, recently we had a session by Raj. It's called the Divine Narrative, and it is a story about uh, what's God's message for us from Genesis to Revelation. And it's an interesting session, so if you want to look at the highlights, it's there online. But more importantly, I look at one thing that I, one of the things that I took away. It says in, um, it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, so from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though once we, we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, and there is a transition, the new is here. 
The Bible promises, and this is part of the lesson, the Bible promises that we live in this present age and the future age is actually coming to our present. It's part of today, everything that we are part of. And the Bible says in uh, 2 Corinthians 3, we are being <coughs> transformed, being transformed. It's a continuous process, being transformed into the image that God wants us to be part of. But I love the way that particular lesson, because he says the future has come in, and you know, this is where we are. We are part of the present age, but we are also part of the future age to come. So we are in that, in that particular over, where, where the world pulls us and the word encourages us to be part of it. Now, this is the area. Yeah? You, you can look at God's creation and we can be actually amazed, be amazed at how he allows the light of his creation to shed light on his word. How many of you know about a butterfly? A butterfly. What is special about a butterfly? Sorry? Metamorphosis. So you have this thing called a bug, okay? You have you have the uh, you have the bug. You know, if, believe me, if I come across that bug, he'll never become a butterfly. <laughs> because you don't like bugs. I mean, that's what bugs are all about. The only reason a car car caterpillar exists is that he can become a butterfly. The early part of the caterpillar, his only job is to eat. That's all he does. He eats, 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 eats. And then eventually he creates a cocoon for himself. And that cocoon is not a good night's rest. It's actually a place of struggle, of war, and a place of survival. It's, it's, it's a completely transformative scenario because something happens behind. The second part, the green part is a cocoon. He, something is inside, but it's not like he's sleeping. There's something happening, the struggle, that eventually makes it the butterfly it becomes. You know, hibernation or rest is good, but that is not what is happening in that particular thing. Sometimes when the world looks at all of us, and this is eerie because the existence that as disciples we have is like that cocoon, where one part we are not yet, we're no more the caterpillar. The other part we are no more, not yet, Jesus Christ. We're not yet what God wants us to be. It's that struggle. And that struggle is not easy. The struggle of survival is something that eventually can make us that butterfly or it could actually make us leave that struggle and be part of everything else. So the world we live in, can be, I mean, that looks like a cocoon probably, but this is a Christian cocoon. You, we are pulled from either sides, and we have God's word, and this is where we are part of the ecosystem today. So we are neither a caterpillar, not yet a butterfly. That struggle is what is real in our life. Now, sometimes people don't like to be in that part, and they struggle through and break, break away from that cocoon without becoming a butterfly. And the well-meaning people can open that cocoon and help out, but eventually, because it's half metamorphosized, it, it crawls through its rest of its life, it's not able to fly or be that butterfly. So that struggle is absolutely paramount, important, in everything that we are part of. So struggle builds the strength, it makes us fly, just as the butterfly does. So without struggle, that strength doesn't exist. So let's go in our Bibles to uh, the book of Romans. So I want to encourage us as disciples, those who make the journey, the pain, the challenge, the daily scenario which, which makes us feel like I'm trapped. Why do I have this pull from the world and from the world? Why is there this kind of a thing that I'm going through? Because I've given myself over to God. And if you look at the Bible over and over again, that pain, that joy, that love, that fruitfulness, everything is part of the package that God has put aside for us. And that is a life worth living. So let's look at Romans 7 today. That's our passage for the day. What then shall we say? This is, of course, Paul speaking, but perhaps 
it could be the way we talk about our own Christian life. What then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet, if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. This is what Paul has to say. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the Lord had not said it. If the law had not said it, you shall not covet. That's the 10th commandment, by the way. But sin seizing an opportunity through the commandment produced in me all kinds of covetousness. This is Paul speaking. For apart from the law, the sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law. But when the commandment came, sin also came alive, alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be the death of me. For sin seizing an opportunity through the commandment deceived me and through it killed me. So the law is holy, the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Now did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good in order that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. I hope we have not lost yet. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of flesh and I'm sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. I do not want to do what I want, want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, for I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not, we are in verse 19, for I do not, why is this 19? Sorry. Verse 19, yes. for I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells within me. For I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil is close at hand. For I delight in the law of the Lord in my inner being, but I see in my members another law, waging war against the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in all my members, which means the body. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? In verse 25 it says, Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I know I, law, I serve the law of sin. A huge passage, but perhaps something relatable. Where we can actually, this could be our daily struggle. This could be something that we know is part of our life. But let's break this down a little bit. Because being a Christian, honestly, doesn't mean moving from fighting to being in peace. Being a Christian means shifting from a battle that we cannot win to a battle we cannot lose. The battle that we cannot win. Verses 7 to 13, that describes the battle that we cannot live, that we cannot win. Before Jesus came, it was the law that was permeating all our lives. And it's a fight between the law and between us. I don't know how many of you, before coming to Dubai, knew what is the yellow line. What's the yellow line on the road? Anyone? I'm sorry? Emergency line. But in your country, did you have it, Tony? Not in my country. <laughs> we did have this yellow light. Was that in any other country? I don't know, maybe US, but was it in the UK, bro? UK has it? Okay. So probably some of the countries have, but most of the countries don't have. But when I came here, I realized that's a law. You cannot cross it. Now if I cross it, it's because I willfully cross it. When I was young, uh, I remember I was probably about five years old, and I took 25 paise, which is uh, one fill today's term, one fill. You convert that into Indian rupees, that's about 20 fills, 22 fills, uh, 22 paise. And I took this 25 paise, we call it four on us. Okay, I took it to my school. On my way back, 
I went to my favorite shop, bought all the chocolates. You could get a lot of stuff. I bought all the chocolates and I came home. And uh, that evening, my, when my mom came back, she was the principal of my school, by the way. When she came back, she asked me, did you go to that shop? And my mind goes, Ding. I know what's in store. And uh, my first thing that came out was, no. Did you buy nothing there? <coughs> Obviously, by now, I should have been smart enough. But when you're four or five, you're not thinking about all of that. Let me tell you, the next 15 minutes, I got spanked with the cane on the, that's the first time the cane came out of the wall and was on all over my body. Of course, I learned next time to do something bad, but not to make sure that they don't know, I'll go to another shop where she will not go to. <laughs> now, let me illustrate this. I knew telling lies was wrong, and I got spanked that day for telling lies. That was the law I broke. Taking the 25 fills, if I just or I say if I just said that I've done it, I probably would have escaped, and there would have been some teaching that this cannot be part of your, this doesn't belong to you, you cannot take it. But I did not do that. So what I didn't know could have saved me if I had just been forthright. But knowing the law, I broke the law because of my fear. My fear, oh, if I tell the truth, then what is in store for me? And so I broke that law. In the Old Testament, it's all about our law. And it's not easy to be able to be in that battle and win. Because the law is so vast. You could have ten commandments and easily forgive, for, easily break one or the other on a daily basis. Thou shalt honor your father and mother. Did you do it every day of your life, Andrew? Thou shalt not tell a lie. Thou shalt not covet. It's even in your mind. I mean, you could go, the, and that's just the Ten Commandments. There are a huge number of laws. And that is the battle we're talking about. Because before the law of God, we all fall short of the glory of God. We cannot be in that battle and win that battle. Are you with me, church? Yes. And all of our life, our battle is between two selves. Before we know Christ, our battle is uh, between the law and us. After we know Christ, the battle is between our sinful nature and the Spirit of God that's within us. So what Paul is trying to say here is, listen, the 10th commandment, thou shalt not covet. And he said, everything that I, I know, I, I, I've coveted. I've, I've, I've wanted it. It says, produced in me all kinds of covetousness in, in verse 8. Because apart from the law, the sin lies dead. If that law wasn't there, the sin would not have been exposed. So the law is good that it exposes sin or it teaches us what is sin, what is wrong according to God. And then there is a battle that we cannot lose. So this is the battle that man wages with a sinful nature against the law. This battle that we cannot lose, especially for Christians, is a battle between our own sinful nature and the spirit. You see, everyone, from verses 14 to 25, that's what Paul says. I do the things I do not want to do. And he says, everyone has a moral compass. We know what we should be doing. We know on a daily basis what we should watch out, what we should not. And sometimes we may not know about something, but that is different. But a lot of times we live intentionally. And why? Because by nature, we are not obedient. By nature, we are the opposite. We will do the things we are not supposed to do if you know that you can get away with it. I, I remember uh, in the early days, I was a software engineer, and I was uh, in charge of a lot of things, but I had no qualms of taking paper, which I needed to print at home, of taking stuff which, till they studied the Bible and said, was it not stealing? Were you not taking what doesn't belong to you? And it was, it is something that opens up your heart to, now, really, that is, you just do it. You just do those things till somebody tells you no. And now when you cross the line, then that becomes sin and that becomes part of our scenario. You see, the battle that we cannot lose as Christians is because there is a spirit that is indwelling in our lives. And that allows us to be able to fight the things that we know is against the law. 
But in verse 25, Paul breaks out in an incredible song. It says, Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we are able to be in a battle that we cannot lose. Does that come home to us? That there is an incredible thing called salvation, called Jesus Christ, called a promise, called to be saved. Because before, we had no chance to win, but with Jesus, we have no chance to lose. We are today in an incredible battle where we cannot lose because the battle has been won. He became wretched on the cross so that we could become righteous before the one and only. You see, for Christians, it's a Dr. Jekyll, Dr. Hyde fight. It's on a daily basis there are things that we know. And we know from the Bible that very often we fall short because we've not fully understood who Jesus is. Now many years ago, probably a century ago, a student in the Oxford University uh, was taking an important uh, examination in religious, religious uh, studies. The examination question that day was, okay, write about the religious and the spiritual meaning in the miracle of Christ turning water into wine. Okay? For two hours, the whole crowd sat and wrote essays and uh, used theses, of course. But there was this young boy, whom we know later as Lord Byron. He just could not write anything. And right at the end, at the end of two hours, the proctor said, listen, you need to write something when you submit. So he wrote down this one line. And this is, you can do a search on this. The water met its master and blushed. A 12-year-old guy could not write that one statement. The water met its master and blushed. And if you want an explanation, I'll tell you that. But it is important to know our Savior. Water turning to wine was just one miracle. But how many miracles are we missing out on a daily basis with God? Because we do not have the depth of that understanding of who God is. God is an incredible God who actually reveals himself to us in our times of prayer, but also in our times of meditation. In our quiet times, not, it's not just about a few voices or words that you speak up. Sometimes we need to wait and allow God to speak to us. And God speaks in a whisper. It is important to listen, his plan, his divine inter intervention in our life. Because there is. There is something that God has to say. But we need to know our Savior to know that we are in a battle that we cannot lose. And I always tell this to people who say, oh, I've been through a tough time. I've, had, I've been a victim of scenarios. I'm depressed. I'm telling you, if you are in that battle and if Jesus and the Spirit is on your side, you have either not understood Jesus and the Spirit or you have actually not chosen to understand. You don't have to be in that battle where you cannot win. You are in a battle that you cannot lose. So there is no excuse for depression. Now I'm not saying we don't have empathy one for the other, but do not stay in that same space. It is important to transition from that battle that you cannot win to that battle you cannot lose. And how do we make the transition? If you're visiting with us today, I want to encourage you that because there is a before Christ and there's an after Christ scenario in all of our lives, it is not just in time, AD and BC. It is something that is there in our own lives. The time when we are out there with the world and nothing to stop us. And we did not even call it sin. There was no law. We did not accept that law for ourselves. But then, then there is this time when we stepped into the cocoon of Christianity. Where we wanted to be part of Jesus and the journey that he called us into. I don't know whether you realize this. But everyone is waiting for somebody. The Hindus have been waiting for Kalki, their Messiah, for 3,700 years. The Buddhists have been, have been waiting for Maitreya, who's supposed to come for 2,600 years. The Jews are till today waiting for the Messiah, even though he was in amongst them, 2,500 years. The Sunnah, they're waiting there for their prophet Isa for the last 1,400 years. And we can go on. The Muslims are waiting for the Messiah for 1,300 years from the Mohammedan line. 
You have the Shiites waiting for Mahdi. You have the Persians that's from Iran, a, a whole Jusians as they call it. They are waiting for Hamza ibn Ali for a thousand years. Most religions will tell you that a savior will come because the world needs a savior. The world needs somebody to be able to be safe from because the world is in its present stage evil and far away from God. And the gospel declares, the gospel declares that the Messiah the world is waiting for is in Jesus Christ. And that's the message that we embraced. Many of us didn't understand the enormity of that decision that we took. But we took the decision to be with Jesus. But that decision does not guarantee for us anything simple. Rather, it is that transformative journey that we are part of today, brothers and sisters. In Christ alone, we sang that song today. My hope is found. We find temporarily our hope in learning. And please be warned that you need to upgrade yourself no matter what. Do that. But we put our hope in relationships. Feel free to have relationships that you can bond with. And that is important. We put our hope and faith in a lot of things around us, including our bank balances. But let me tell you, if in Christ alone, we put our faith, we are in a battle that cannot be lost. And how you transition is to be able to, to be part of that journey where God calls us to be obedient, to be obedient in the way we follow Jesus. Because the battle belongs to the Lord. We are all of us in that battle. On a daily basis, we are in that battle. On a daily basis, there are things that can take away our joy, that could take us on a misguided path, that could easily stumble us. The battle belongs to the Lord. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Right, Mishnu? There is no condemnation. That was his message today. But that is the message of the Bible. It is amazing that the battle in our hearts doesn't matter as much anymore because Jesus actually has won the war. The battle is something temporary. The war is the ultimate. And the Bible says whether, it's, whether we like it or not, the war has been won. Look at Revelation 7. Satan has been destroyed. He has been hurled into this earth. His time is short. He will do whatever. Skirmishes may break out, but you and me have the hope in Christ. And we are in that battle that can never be lost. The only call for us in Christ is to be the change. To be the change that God desires for ourselves. We can be transformed by our obedience to Christ. And no matter what it is, let me tell you, when, when, when I got that spanking, I didn't learn to overcome lying. Lying was part of my life for a long time. For a long time. Even after becoming a disciple, that was something that I struggled with. Now this time it's not so simple as a great lie, but you still make those gray areas and you go, I can get away with it. But if only we could stop. And if only we could have a look at the transformative journey that we are part of. The Bible says, if only we can be the change. You know, my challenge for the church today is to be the change. In our homes, be the change. Husbands, it's your responsibility to lead spiritually. But to also make this Valentine Day ecosystem throughout your life. To be able to have that spirit of love, that spirit of leadership, that spirit of humility which comes from knowing that you are not threatened by anybody, not the least from your own wife. Wives, it's important to know that you can be the biggest builder or the destroyer of your own marriage. And so it can go on. You know, we could be in the church and we could say, oh, we need better leadership. We need better this. We need better that. But be the change. Be part of that. And let it not be said this leader tag makes a difference. Lead in the way we lead. We live. We live. <coughs> in the world, we would want more empathy. But overcome selfishness and be a giver wherever you are. People will know that you are a follower of Jesus. Change can not only transform us, can actually 
transform people around us. A farmer wrote this. A rattlesnake bit one of my sheep in the face about a week ago. Deadliest snake that lives around here, the sheep's face swelled up and hurt terribly. The sheep swelled for about two days, but the blood of the lamb destroyed the venom of the serpent. The sheep kept on eating, kept on drinking, kept on climbing because she knew everything was all right. I don't know whether we know this, but a snake bite can be cured by the anti-venom created by injecting venom into a sheep. The sheep creates the antibodies. That antibodies becomes the anti-venom. And that in some way should allow us to understand that we don't have to be worried about the serpent or the spite. If we have the blood of the lamb flowing in our veins. Brothers and sisters, the call is to be the change. Let's not find faults in everything around us, but if we can be part of the change, if we can be able to remain in him and remain in his truth, if we are able to do the will of God, if we can be an obedient heart towards God's word, if we remain in him, we will be transformed and we will be eventually be able to fly into the presence of God. To God be the glory. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Gary, and this is my partner, Arlene. And thank you, Jacob, for that uh, wonderful message. Uh, actually, the example uh, said uh, before us that metamorphosis thing, you know, it's, it's a lovely thing, right? Uh, you can see the struggle from being a caterpillar and going through all that process, you know? They can be eaten or they can fall away from the branch. But the thing there is, after those process, the outcome was such a beautiful form, right? Although it could be short-lived, as we know, butterflies doesn't last long, no? they don't live long. But the thing there, as uh, Jacob said, no, uh, that change could probably have an effect everyone around us. So have that uh, positivity, uh, regardless of your situation. And uh, we just thought of you know, sharing that we know that life can be a changing season in such a way as a nature, right? We could, you know, be productive, we could be contented or in good health, but in one snap, we'll fall into death, we can fall in financial crisis or even illness, right? So, in spite of this, we have this, you know, we have this anchor of God's unchanging and uh, faithfulness that will be all right for us, right? And I just want to point out uh, one hindrance probably for the change, and that is, you know, we have to overcome our uh, sinful habits by, you know, trying to recognize that our problem is really spiritual in that sense. And we ask ourselves, why do we indulge to the point that we are being mastered by temptation, right? So. We all know that the Lord is progressively uh, setting us free from sin, but although the battles are, you know, difficult, the, cert the outcome is certain that uh, after death or when Christ returns, we won't be able to feel that struggle again as uh, we have heard today. So, uh, through all of life's many changes, just need the anchor of God's unchanging faithfulness to encourage us. Okay, so here's my wife for her thoughts in that house. Yes, uh, struggle is real, yet the love and mercy of God is more powerful for us to overcome those things. We are not able to win the battle against our sinful nature, but by the grace of God, we will overcome the battle. We, If we surrender everything to Christ, then uh, it's just a reminder that Christ died for us to win that battle. We just need to know Him deeper and what He can do in our life. Yes. For the announcement, um, next Sunday there won't be a church house church. Instead, we will be back here in the Oval Hall at 1 p.m. on February 25th. Guillermo Adame will be our visiting speaker. Uh, and thank you for those who come and visit us. And uh, please join us to our midweek worship in our near you. Near you. Ask the person who invited you for the details. Kids Kingdom, parents, please 
do pick up your kids as soon as this worship service finishes and let's remember to thank the volunteer <coughs> teachers. Regular monthly contribution can be handed in over to your respective finance representative or your Bible talk leaders. Singles retreat, we call in Darwin to give us more details. Where are my singles at? <laughs> Raise your hand, singles! Oh, Where are my singles at? Okay. <laughs> Alright, we're going to have a retreat. It's going to be uh, February. I'm not sure. February 24, 25. Uh, it will be in Barracuda. Uh, I would like to inform everyone, especially singles, that starting to, uh, sorry, Sunday today is the last payment for uh, Bible Talk leaders. Uh, if you know anyone, singles, who have, have, are having financial problems, please help them. And also, um, we also have this, a bus pickup will be on Saturday at Jollibee, Burjaman, 7.30 a.m. sharp. Uh, please coordinate with Meshul or April if you, have any, if you need more details. Starting tomorrow, we will have a week-long devotion. We have... Uh, we appreciate the hearts of uh, some singles who share their personal quiet times to be part of this devotion. Um, the devotion will be shared in the WhatsApp uh, UAE Singles group. Also, we will also have prayer and fasting on Thursday from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. So those who are under medication, I'm sorry, those who are under medication, um, you can uh, excuse yourself from fasting or you can uh, look for any alternatives for fasting. So you can participate with this uh, prayer and fasting for our retreat. Now, I'm sure uh, most of us are already thinking about our expectations for the retreats for the singles. And instead of getting caught up on the details uh, of the program or what to expect, let us shift our focus to Jesus' powerful um, promise in Matthew 18, 20. It says, for there are two or three gathered in my name, there am I with them. Amen? So our retreat is about creating space and time where people with open hearts are gathered in Jesus' name. And according to his word, he himself will be present among us during that time. Okay? So the real question is not what will happen, what to expect, but are you really coming for Jesus? Are you coming because you really want to understand the theme scripture for your life and how you can get that peace? Okay, if your answer is yes, then I am excited for you. No matter what your expectations are, come with an open heart and desire to encounter Jesus. He's waiting to meet you. Okay, trust in the Spirit's work in us, each in our hearts that as we begin to worship during that day, you will be blessed because you came. Amen? Amen. Thank you. Uh, we call in also uh, Myla for the Women's Day announcement. Thank you and good afternoon brothers and sisters. Uh, it is with great joy to announce that it is the time of the year that we celebrate the Women's Day with the theme, Together We Thrive. On 3rd March 2024, that is two more Sundays from now, uh, here at the Voice International, Oval Hall, 12.30 to 3 p.m. Uh, our guest speaker is Dr. Anya Stan, all the way from Singapore. Uh, we ask all of you to invite your women, friends, family members, and colleagues. And if you have already decided in your heart that you're going to attend, please register yourselves and your guests to your Bible Talk uh, leaders. Also, please be informed that there is no fee to register to this event. Thank you, and let us all be prayerful for a fruitful Women's Day event. Thank you, Maya, and Darwin, and so we'd like to thank the worship team for the wonderful songs uh, for today. Michelle for that uh, message uh, from, for the communion and of course for Jacob for the main sermon. Okay, uh, let's go to God in prayer. Mighty Father in heaven, we're just so grateful that uh, we're given the opportunity to worship you once again. And as we leave this place, uh, we pray that uh, you'll be with us in spirit. Uh, 
providing uh, provisions and uh, keeping our uh, health and uh, safety at all times. Lord, just pray for all those uh, people who are now uh, suffering heartaches or uh, having uh, issues within their families, within within their institution, uh, that uh, you heal them and grant them peace, Lord. And for the word, words that we heard from today, Lord, may it always uh, charge us and brings us uh, something to learn and uh, look forward in uh, things that uh, best things to come for us, Lord. Again, thank you for uh, this day that uh, we are able to worship you and may all these things be always glorify your name. For all this we pray, in Jesus' name, Amen. 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 All right, let's all stand up. I'm encouraged today because I really felt the spirit uh, working in the service. You know, this song I chose initially, it's because I want to remind the singles of the retreat that we had before, but I didn't know that it's very aligned with the message that we have right now. Uh, in Jesus' name, it's really a song that reminds us that through this battle, you are not alone. Even though it feels like you're alone, but you're not really alone. God is fighting for us, okay, pushing back the darkness. God is in your story, okay, in every detail, in your highs and lows. So let's sing this song in Jesus' name.
Yeah.